coming to you live from our studios on Slaughterhouse Road in Belize City. This is Love Television's Evening News. We've got a full newscast for you today. So let us start you off by taking a look at the leading stories for today, Wednesday, May 27. <music> Body of a second Roaring Creek villager found Prime Minister Dean Barrow meets with union leaders, outspoken attorney to be cited for contempt of court. Taiwanese ambassador hands over five million U.S. dollars grant to Belize and Statistical Institute of Belize releases latest figures. Yesterday, we reported on the gruesome discovery of the body of 28-year-old Edilberto Madrid. Today, the body of one, Ma one of Madrid's co-workers, Stephen Hyde, was discovered in a shallow grave. We hear more in this report. The search for 51-year-old Stephen Hyde, a resident of Rain Creek Village, who was reported missing on Monday, May 25th, came to a tragic end this afternoon, Wednesday, May 27th, sometime around 3 o'clock, when his body was found buried at a farm in the young girl era of Kamalote Village. Love News spoke to Viola Spence, the mother of the deceased, who was the last one to speak to her son. On the morning he come, and he tell me, he said, Ma, he said, I can spend my half day with you and half day with my sister. And he gone to his sister. And he come back the afternoon and spend the next half day with me. As you may say, I find he gone the evening late. I got some food Monday, ma Monday, Monday evening. We got him a holiday. He said, Russell, tell him, he said, Boy, you have to work. He tell him, Russell, I know the work. Because today, the holiday, I have to go look for my mom and my sister. Then. And he come down here. And afterwards, he said, Ma, he said, I'm going. He said, I, I got some food, and he gone. I got a hammock, a new brand hammock. Mm -hmm. And he gone with it, and some clothes. And from then, I know, see him again. And today, when I see the police, they come, you know, I didn't make sign to them. What happened? Mm -hmm. What happened? I said, I find my son dead. The police on his smile. And then afterwards, I gone out there. When I got out and they said that they find the body of Stephen Hyde in our shallow grave back at Hyde Farm. Yeah, and the two hands they cut off and two foot. Yeah. I hope that the person, I tell her, they find a guard hand. The man they high, but they look low. And God will take care of him in a correct way, the way how he do my son. Reporting for Love News from the village of Ruin Creek, I am Angelica Cruz. The Statistical Institute of Belize today issued its latest figures, which looked at the gross domestic product, GDP, the external trade statistics, and consumer price index inflation rate statistics for the first quarter for the year 2015. Reporter Hippolyta Novella was there, and he filed this report. According to the Statistical Institute of Belize, in the first three months of 2015, Belize experienced a 7% growth in gross domestic product. Up until April, the total production was valued at $733.8 million. It is the highest number recorded between the years 2010 and 2015 during the same period. There are several factors that played a role in this increase, which are agriculture, manufacturing and tourism, as explained by statistician Angelita Campbell. Within the primary industry, the agriculture and forestry sector went up by 19.6%, and that can be seen in an increase in banana of 22.6%. Orange also went up by 129%, and that is as a result of a change in the harvest season. We have sugarcane, however, decreasing by 2.7%, and that is explained by a change in um, a late start sorry, in the harvest season of sugarcane. Fishing also went up by 16.5%, and that is as a result of the expansion in the fish farm production. We also see shrimp export going up by $5 million more. We see manufacturing and mining going up by 18%. Within that sector, we have citrus concentrate going up by 121%, and that follows suit uh, with the orange production. We have petroleum continuing a decline trend and that decreased by 15.3%. We also had flour going down by 7.5%. However, we had beverages going up by 6.5%, and that is reflected with an increase in beers of 6.7%, and soft drinks going up by 
uh, tertiary industry, sorry, went up by 4.7%. And within the industry, we see hotel and restaurants increasing by 6%. That is explained by an increase in cruise passenger visitors of 10.5%. And that can be explained by an additional 33,000, roughly, persons visiting um, more in comparison to last year. Marine product for this quarter stands at 4.5 million pounds, the highest so far. Banana increase from 2.8 metric tons to 27.9 metric tons. Citrus increase by a high number. Sugar cane decrease by 12.4 metric tons, but there was an increase of sugar production by 7.7%. This is a result of extraction efficiency. Petroleum extraction has been decreasing over the years. There was also a decrease of electricity generation in the first quarter. In April 2015, Belize imported goods valued at $157.6 million, representing a slight decrease of 1.4% as explained by Tiffany Vasquez, statistician at the SIB. Major contributors to change in imports included imports to the commercial free zones, which grew by $24.6 million, due mostly to increased importation of cigarettes and clothing. Imports of machinery and transport equipment grew by $5 million due to increased purchases of bottling equipment and vehicles. Imports of manufactured goods went up by $12.1 million as importation of construction supplies continues to grow. Spending on fuels and lubricants declined by $21.4 million while the volume of all main fuels, which include diesel, kerosene, regular, premium, and butane, all increased in January to April of this year. Imports to the commercial free zones and export processing zones accounted for 22.4% of Belize's imports, with machinery and transport equipment and manufactured goods holding an almost similar share at 20.9% and 19.8% respectively. 12.3% of all imports were fuels and lubricants, while food constituted the smallest share at 10%, 10.5%, excuse me. Most of Belize's imports came from United States of America with $203.5 million. As for Belize's exports, for the first quarter, it stood at $56.3 million, a decrease of 5.2% when compared to 2014 during the same period. This was attributed to the number of barrels of crude petroleum exported, compounded by the world price of the good. However, all major exports increased. According to the SIB, during the month of April 2015, the prices of goods and services were an average of 1% lower than April 2014, as explained by Marilyn Pinello Lee, the economic statistics manager. We have food and non-alcoholic beverages down by 0.3%, housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels down by 0.6%, transport down by 6.4%, and all other goods and services up by 0.5%. The housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels category is comprised of electricity tariffs and beauty and prices. Electricity, price, electricity tariffs sorry, were decreased in January of this year and are more than 20% lower than they were in April of 2014. On average, a 100-pound cylinder of butane is now $93 compared to $126 12 months ago. Looking at the transport category, which is down by 6.4%, we attribute this decrease mainly to decreased fuel prices. The food and alcoholic beverages, housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels, along with the transport category, together comprise approximately 70% of the CPI, while the all other goods and services category account for approximately 30%. Reporting for Love News, Hippolyta Novello. Prime Minister Dean Barrow today received a 5 million US dollar check from the Taiwanese ambassador Benjamin Ho. The check is a grant on the bilateral cooperation program between the two countries. According to government, the funds will be used to cover part of the expenditure on key infrastructural projects 
including the Belize City Southside Poverty Alleviation Project Phase 3, the extension of the Southern Highway to Halakte in the Toledo District, and the new crossing of the Macau River in the twin towns of San Ignacio and Santa Elena. The territorial dispute between Belize and Guatemala is one that has been ongoing for decades, spanning from as far back as 1940. Efforts have been made in the last seven decades or so to settle the claim, but it all failed, leaving both countries to date in another round of diplomatic attempts in reaching a solution. Back in 2007, the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Jose Miguel Insouza, recommended to Belize and Guatemala that both countries take the unresolved territorial dispute to the International Court of Justice. His recommendation came out of the agreement on having a formulated plan, a plan that would seek to foster sound negotiations and confidence-building measures between both countries that would lead to the end of Guatemala's claim over parts of Belize. At the time of the recommendation by the OAS Secretary General, Said Musa was Belize's Prime Minister. In an interview conducted back then, Musa stated that his administration would be seeking to conduct the referendum after the general elections that were slated for 2008. Here is that interview with Musa as the then Prime Minister of Belize and his sentiments on going to a referendum on the ICJ issue. The video footage comes to us courtesy Vaughn Gill. The Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Mr. Insulza, has now made a recommendation that to reach a settlement between Belize and Guatemala over this long-standing differendum, that we should pursue going to the International Court of Justice to have a judicial or a juridical solution to the problem. Uh, this has come about because, as you know, we've had ongoing negotiations over the years, and as recent as September 2005, we began a new round of negotiations. But all these negotiations came to naught. Uh, in fact, in more recent times, we were trying to see if we could arrive at a settlement at least on the maritime areas, and even that has failed. So I think uh, that's the backdrop to why the Secretary General of the OAS feels that, and has recommended, that we should now consider both parties going to the International Court of Justice to make a ruling on this matter. I should say that it's a recommendation that is not unexpected, but it's also a recommendation that will require very careful analysis and consultation with the Belizean people. And this uh, consultation, this comprehensive uh, <coughs> discussion and analysis will take place not before, but after the general elections. That was over seven years ago in 2007. The general elections came in March 2008, stripping the Musa administration of its powers and installing for the first time the Barrow administration. But before we bring you up to speed with where we currently are on the matter of negotiations, we thought it would be interesting to hear just what the former Prime Minister Said Musa had to say on the strength of Belize's case in Guatemala's unfounded claim. The basic implication is that once both parties agree to accept the court ruling on a binding basis, then we are bound by that decision. We've always been maintained and believe that Belize has a very strong case. And it's not just me or politicians saying that. It is based on all the legal advice and expert advice that we've received over the years. So I think it is quite an achievement in a sense if Guatemala agrees to have this matter settled uh, juridically. Because I feel very confident that Belize has a very strong case very strong ironclad case in maintaining our existing borders which were established way back in 1859 defined and of course in terms of the law of the sea in terms of the maritime matters that will be determined by established law of the sea convention but let me quickly add it is not what i feel or what i suggest it is what the belizean people after hearing all the 
arguments, the pros and the cons, they will decide in the end whether or not we go to court to have this matter settled. When the Barrow administration took over office in 2008, negotiations between the two countries continued, and in December 2008, a special agreement was signed in which both countries agreed to hold simultaneous referenda to get the voters' decision on whether or not the matter should go to the International Court of Justice. The referenda in both Belize and Guatemala was to take place on October 6, 2013. But that never came to fruition, as Guatemala had decided that they would not hold their referendum unless Belize had changed its referendum laws to a minority vote, which they claimed would have leveled the playing field. Guatemala's reluctance back in 2013 has now brought us to the signing of another document, which happened this past Monday in Guatemala with representation from Belize and the OAS. We will have more on the signing of the amended articles later in our newscast. Earlier this year, the agreement for mediation of the dispute between the Belize Grassroots Youth Empowerment Association, BIGIE, and the government of Belize over the road reserve at Harmonyville on the George Price Highway neared solution. This was confirmed by BIGIE's attorney, Audrey Matura Shepard. Most of the issues had been worked out, and only matter of building of roads remained to be addressed as well as legal costs. The mediation process of the dispute is closely guarded and Justice Courtney Abel has moved to cite Matura Shepherd for contempt of court for premature revelations on the case. The case was scheduled for this morning but was adjourned to July as Matura Shepherd is currently involved in a criminal trial and Justice Abel is out of the country. Matura Shepherd declined comment to reporters at the courthouse today. Prime Minister Dean Barrow met with union members, that should be with members of the National Trade Union Congress of Belize, to discuss the proposed amendments to the Petrocaribe Loans Act and the union's concerns. Audrey Matura Shepherd is the president of the Christian Workers Union. Focusing on what this discussion is, is we are looking at the amendments. We've heard out the Prime Minister, I must say he graciously conceded to some of the points that we've made. and. One of the main points he conceded to was that the retrospectivity of it, as he said, was merely to get um, past or over the legal challenge, which was a position that I personally have already said and the union already recognized. But there were a lot of other points that were discussed and what we will hear from our president is that we go back now to our general council, discuss everything that was discussed at this meeting and then move ahead with that. The big issue now is that we actually have an amendment. We have to go back and discuss it. One of the key, or two of the key offensive parts of the um, original act was not being changed, but there are other areas that we've been clamoring as a union, and I personally have spoken about against it directly when it comes to issue of accountability and transparency. Those are being addressed. We were told that we could um, send in and submit any proposed changes we'd want, and that's, that's what we, we will do. Marvin Mora, president of the National Trade Union Congress of Belize, explained that the National Trade Union Congress of Belize is not against the Petra Curry bill. However, they are looking for transparency and accountability. What I can tell you is the amendment itself that the government is proposing is addressing some of the major issues um, that in high sight probably could have been addressed by the government then if they have done consultation. As a matter of fact, one of the things that the Prime Minister conceded is that he could have and probably he should have, but in his wisdom as a leader, sometimes you have to take uh, the bull by the horns and make certain decisions. Uh, mind you, his re or as or I'd say his uh, reasoning for so doing was basically to safeguard the program, according to what he explained to us in there. So, one of the things that we are looking uh, is the fact of the retrospectivity of, of the changes. But we are also looking at where we are and where we want to go. If you realize, the NTUCB has never been against the Petrocar Bill. And if that was out there, we have always clarified that. We've always, even in programs that were invited, we have made that position clear. We're not against the Petrocar Fund, we're against the, the bill and how it basically circumvents some of the 
accountability and transparency uh, measures that are within the, the Finance Reform Act. Mora further stated that the Prime Minister reiterated his position that the amendments will not allow for any administration to abuse the petrochemical funds. The Prime Minister reiterated that he's open to receive any um, input from on, on behalf of the NTUCB that would strengthen the, the amendment to the act that he has uh, proposed already. One of the things that we point blank asked the Prime Minister, actually was the last thing that we asked, that if he is confident that, let's say, the unthinkable for him would happen where his government would lose power in this upcoming or uh, imminent upcoming elections, and you have a change of leadership in the government, if he is confident enough that the not only the, the, the petrochemical bill, but the amendments that he's putting in are good enough so that it would not allow any other administration to abuse the petrochemical fund, and he said that he is 100% confident. Still, he opened up the doors, not only for the, for the Congress to, to inject something in that, in that regard, if it, is, if it were possible, but also for other suggestions in regards to the petrochemical bill. So these are the things that we have to go back to our membership on, have discussions with them, get their feedback and then formulate positions, make decisions on a go-forward basis. The conversation with the Prime Minister has started and it, it has not done, actually it is started. The trade union has a time span of two weeks to make proposals on the amendment and present them to the Prime Minister. Earlier, we brought you a brief history of negotiations that have been undertaken between Belize and Guatemala to settle Guatemala's claim of certain parts of Belize. As we mentioned, there was the special agreement document signed in 2008 in which both countries were to go to simultaneous referendum. But with that not happening and with discussions ongoing, the two countries came together again on Monday, May 25 in Guatemala to sign on to amendments of that special agreement. Belize's Foreign Affairs Minister Wilfred Elrington addressed the gathering in which he explained that the amendments were simply done to allow Guatemala to hold its referendum on a date independent of Belize's referendum date, yet to be determined. It is worthy of note that the amended protocol does not extinguish the possibility of holding the referendum simultaneously. That original option remains intact. The protocol does no more than add an element of flexibility with respect to the time for the holding of each national referendum. The special agreement remains the same in all other respects. Our government is irrevocably committed to being bound by the decision of the Belizean electorate on this claim as manifested in a referendum. It is also irrevocably committed to holding a referendum on the claim at the earliest possible convenient date. It is of significance to note that the special agreement as amended treats not only with the protocol for going to the International Court of Justice, but it also sets out clear procedures to be followed relating to the implementation of the decision of the court. This is an exceedingly important and necessary element for putting finality to the claim and ancillary matters thereto. Notably missing from the event were representatives from the People's United Party, who had notified the Belizean public that they would not be taking part in the signing as they were not consulted on the final amendments made to the document. We understand that Guatemala is seeking to have their referendum held simultaneously with their upcoming elections later this year. Guatemala's territorial claim goes back for about seven decades now, in which they are seeking to gain more than half of Belize's land mass, including significant portions of the Belize, Cayo, Stan Creek, and Toledo districts. It is indeed a huge claim against Belize, and according to Elrington, the matter will be treated with much urgency. This is a matter of urgency and importance for both countries. And I can assure you that, in fact, certainly in the case of Belize, it's not going to be much longer now before we hold our referendum. And I'm assured by the Guatemalan foreign minister, my trusted colleague, 
that in fact they propose to go even before us. But the assurance that have been given by our Prime Minister is that it is going to be done shortly thereafter. We have in place a commission that is responsible for the education of the Belizean populace in relation to this matter. That is an ongoing process. We are going to expedite the process and make it more intense in the months that are coming. Um, and the intention really is to get every sector of the society involved, public, private, religious, business, professionals, everyone, schools, and all the institutions. Belize has a fairly small population, and it is not very difficult to, to, to reach all our population within a relatively short time. The difficulty is that this is not a matter that has been dealt with as often as we would have liked, and so it is going to take some time to sensitize people so that they can digest uh, and, and properly appreciate the issues that are at stake. But um, we are in the process of doing that. We will expedite that process, and we hope to be able to conclude the process within a relatively short time. While Ellerington has said that Belize will hold its referendum sooner rather than later, the Prime Minister of Belize, Dean Barrow, had assured the media on May 14 this year that it would not be held simultaneously with the country's election. A Belizean young woman has been selected to be a part of the conservation leadership in the Caribbean Fellows Program for the period May 2015 to October 2016. Rochelle Renault, who was formerly attached to the Belize Coalition to Save Our Natural Heritage, is one of 20 participants from various Caribbean countries who will be undergoing training in the area of conservation. The fellowship seeks to provide a head start for those seeking a career in conservation as it provides skills training, networking opportunities, and participation in an initiative that provides real benefits to endangered species, the ecosystems, and the landscapes of the Caribbean region. Other persons chosen are from Colombia, Guatemala, Dominica, Trinidad and Tobago, Nicaragua, among others. Reno has a bachelor's degree in environmental science and policy from the University of South Florida, USA. The program is funded in part by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service with support from the International Fund for Animal Welfare. The program begins at the St. George's University in Grenada on June 4 with a three-day training workshop followed by a 10-day short course on the open standards for the practice of conservation. Another report of sexual assault upon a minor has been given to the police, this time in Dangriga. The act was reportedly committed upon an eight-year-old little girl who, in the company of her aunt, told the authorities that her stepfather had sexually assaulted her last year and again about three weeks ago. Love News understands that the stepfather was reportedly under the influence of alcohol when he committed the act. The child was taken to the Southern Regional Hospital where it was verified that she was sexually assaulted. The stepfather has since been arrested and charged with sexual assault. Members of the public service today showcased their roles and responsibilities at an event in Dangriga. Correspondent Harry Arzu spoke with Minister with Responsibility for the Public Service, Charles Gibson. Today is the Public Service Information Day in Dangriga. It's something that we have been celebrating countrywide. We have done it, I think, first in Orange Walk, Belize City, Corozal, and, San, and Punta Gorda. And what we want to do is to have an exhibit whereby ministries and departments will be showcasing their work so that the public can have a better understanding of the services that are offered, but also to get an opportunity to get some feedback as how we can improve service delivery. And of course, one of the perhaps most important thing is to see how we can build partnership and networks so we can uh, really try to uh, offer better service to the public. Public Service Day will be celebrated next week. The Belize Cancer Society will host its annual Cancer Walk this Saturday, May 30, under the theme Cancer Control, Not Beyond Us. The walk kicks off from Ladyville to the Belize Cancer Society's office on Mersaline in Belize City. Heather Renner, Senior Administrator for the Belize Cancer Society, 
says that this year there will be many activities and giveaways for participants who support the fight against cancer. Actually, besides our regular work, we're going to be having different activities. We're going to be having a little warm-up session. And after the cancer walk, we normally have companies that come out and give promotions, having free samples. So this year, you'll be noticing that we'll be having mobile bathrooms as well on the road. So between Salinas and Palova, we'll be having one rest stop at the old um, Williamson compound, and the other rest stop will be at Gastomza. So you'll see water stations along the road to keep you hydrated. If you need a bathroom break, you can also access a bathroom break. And when you get into the Cancer Society office, we're going to be having a grand raffle. So if you partake in the walk and you purchase the shirt, you will be able to get a ticket at one of the registration points on the morning of the walk. And you'd be entitled to win tablets. We're giving um, gift sets, jewelry sets, um, dental cleaning. And if you feel you have a prize that we can give as well, we welcome you to call the office. Rena urges the general public to purchase official Belize Cancer Society products in order to give back and play a role in the effort of awareness and education. We have nice stainless steel water bottles that are hot and cold, either $20, $15. So we have pins as well, we have little wristbands, we have a lot of memorabilia. So if you're not able to come out and walk, we ask you to kindly purchase the official Cancer Walk products, which comes from the society itself. Because when you purchase that shirt, you're giving back something to cancer awareness. You're helping to build education in Belize. You're helping the treatment of a child or an adult, right? So that's the purpose of us trying to raise some funds via the shirt. So when you see that $30 cost, imagine that small fraction that you're helping to change somebody's life. So once a year, it's not a big sacrifice. So we ask you to make that sacrifice for us now on May 30th. Thank you. Thank you. Buses will leave at 3.45 a.m. from in front of Pilate High School, Channel 5, Friendship Restaurant, Shell One Stop, and James Brody and Company Limited. The Olympic Day run is scheduled for May 30, this coming Saturday, and you are being invited to be a part of it. Secretary General of the Olympic Committee, Yolanda Fonseca, told us more. The purpose of this day, Olympic Day run, is they had enlarged the scope to include move, learn, and discover. We are concentrating on the portion of moving, which is being active. And in the participation, we have people who are, are moving, activating, which helps with health, it, it helps with even the environment because when they're running, they're making it, the whole area where they run is sufficiently prepared for them to run freely. Um, it covers different scope, you know, um, even education. And really and truly, sports, sport is something that helps a student in school, keeping the mind alert setting the competition whereby they know that in life they will be faced with challenges but they can by participating by fighting back by strengthening and taking on that they will actually uh, progress in life so sports and life and education is binding and for that reason, we are we extended to all the invitation to all the members of our community, all of Belize, to run and be a part of this uh, day, in commemoration, yes, of the Olympic Day per se, but in truth, that we celebrate us, we celebrate Belizeans, community development. Uh, we form together this unity, this bond in sports, and it becomes a societal thing where all aspects of life is covered. The run starts at 6 a.m. in front of Brodies on Regent Street, and the race starts at 6.30. The first 100 persons will get a free T-shirt. PeaceWorks, a non-governmental organization from the United States, has been closely working with the residents in Dangriga. That should be PeaceWork. Correspondent Harry Arzu tells us how that relationship has benefited the community. PeaceWork and its local partners are once again engaging residents of Dangriga in a variety of community projects 
that are beneficial to those concerned. Love News spoke with Hannah Huntley, who is the organization's field director. For nine consecutive years, PeaceWork and the University of Arkansas has partnered with Dangriga Community on a multitude of service projects across many sectors. This year, 60 students and faculty will be in Dangriga. They arrived May 17th and depart June 6th, and they represent business, ecology, engineering, public health, nutrition, and social work faculties. Some of our past projects over the years have been establishing a microloan program to assist community members in gaining financial independence. Uh, we also partnered with Ecumenical and Derek Jones to build an aquaponic system at Ecumenical High School last year, um, and that's a tilapia farm and garden that provides the kitchen and staff with some with vegetables. Um, and any community member who's interested in learning about that system is welcome to come out and learn about that system as well. Alex McCloyd, who is a member of the nutrition team, shared some of her experiences as a volunteer with Peace Work. The goal of our team is to bring nutrition and gardening into the schools. We have been teaching in many of the primary schools across Dangriga, and we have also taught in other community organizations such as HelpAge and Pala. We focus on nutrition and gardening primarily. The, nutri the nutrition topics we focus on include the food basket, serving sizes, and cooking classes to get the students interested in healthier snacks and meals. The gardening that we work on is to get the schools and students interested in gardening and knowing how to grow their own food. The food from the gardens will be used to sustain the school kitchens and to feed the students. Out of the various projects that Peace Work is carrying out here in this municipality, Lara Mantus, who is volunteering with the health team, also spoke with Love News. So the health team's main objective is to provide information on many different health topics, uh, mainly drawing attention to prevalent health issues in the community and the surrounding communities. And we're doing that through a lot of different projects, such as ho hospice care with Miss Sandra. Um, we're doing a lot of education in different schools like Epworth and Christ the King and Galici. Um, we're also working with community partners like PAWA and BFLA, and we are also hosting rural health fairs in surrounding communities. Reporting for Love News from Dangriga, I'm Harry Arzu. A meeting focusing on disaster management had the participation of representatives of Toledo's NEMO, NGOs, and media yesterday. With that story, here is Paul Mahong. Opening remarks were given by Nemo Toledo Housing and Shelter Committee Chairman, Education Officer Floyd Lino, National Emergency Management Organization Southern Region Coordinator Keith Emanuel facilitated the meeting session. What the Subcommittee for Education, Information and Warning wanted to do was to meet with all the NGOs in the district and the media to basically share and discuss with them the operational structure that is utilized by the district emergency committee during a disaster. They wanted to discuss ways in which they see NGOs and the media cooperating with the district co emergency committee um, in the implementation of its disaster management program in the district. And they wanted to share the operational structures and strategies and how these NGOs can be involved in the implementation of the strategies. What the outcome of the whole um, exercise was for us to establish a strategic partnership with these NGOs and the media. And this strategic partnership is intended that at the end of the day, we would have focused on the appropriate response uh, to emergencies and disasters in the district. We would have some consensus in regards to that, and each of these NGOs and the media would understand their particular role in order to the effective implementation of our disaster strategy in the district. The main presentation during the meeting was made by Keith Emanuel. It was to familiarize everyone with the vision and mission of NEMO, what was the focus areas that NEMO um, focused on in its comprehensive disaster management program, um, how the structure of NEMO works starting from the executive level where the prime minister is the chairperson down to the very um, village emergency committee where the village chairperson is the, is the person at that level. And basically the, we wanted to let them clearly understand that there was these 12 focus areas for disaster management 
were very, very important. And if you look at these 12 areas, they basically include housing and shelter, relief supplies management, damage assessment needs analysis, human resource management, mitigation access and infrastructure works, transport and evacuation, restoration of utilities and water resources management, foreign assistance, search and rescue, medical care and public health, economic recovery and education information and warning. And we were basically trying to give them an understanding of what these areas were all about and how they can fit into these areas with us. Uh, in addition, we basically then look at having them now talk about what, in, what were some of the ways they could, they could uh, link with us to ensure that we make sure that these things work well. They, they have areas of expertise in, in technical, technical areas. They also have access to other resources that we may not have access to that we can utilize. For me, at the end of it all, it was a very, very fruitful meeting. NEMA's Southern Region Coordinator, Keith Emanuel. The 15 participants at the meeting held at Toledo District Education Center included representatives of NEMO, NGOs namely Sustainable Harvest International, SHI, Toledo Institute for Development and Environment, TIDE, Bea Vista Umana People to People, Punta Gorda Rotary, and district media including Love FM, Love TV, Akutan Radio, and PGTV. Reporting for Love News, Paul Mahone, Punta Gorda. Our thought conditioner for today comes from George Bernard Shaw. He says, and we quote, A life spent making mistakes is not only more honorable, but more useful than a life spent doing nothing. End of quote. To have your thought conditioner featured in this segment of a newscast, all you have to do is send us an email. Our email address is news at lovetv.com.tv. This has been the evening news on Love Television. Thanks for watching. I am Renee Trujillo.